I have new business. Bruce with the inspections department. And maybe our most important item of the day. We have a retiring member of the Board of Appeals to recognize today. His name is Harold Thompson. <clears throat> he was initially appointed to the Board of Appeals in June, on June 15th of 1998. And he served 20 years. Well, 20 years. <laughs> he was the chairman of the board for most of those years. He's currently retired, previously with EAPC Architects and other firms, and uh, did a fantastic job for those. I, I did check that, and they all, said, they all agreed with that. Harold was a rock of our code review process. He was instrumental in refining some of the board's processes. He maintained strong leadership skills, rarely missed a meeting, and ran the meetings with professionalism and respect for code, staff, and the board. I have uh, several me memories of Harold and our discussions. Why don't you come up? And the one that sticks in my mind is the uh, egress windows. <laughs> we probably talked on the phone several times. But Harold had a very professional attitude about the code and his profession. He questioned the code. And we like to say we don't have a problem with that. The code isn't always black and white. There's gray areas. There's interpretations. And Harold was very good to work with. He understood the code. He challenged it. And we came to an understanding, even though the code wasn't clear. You will be happy to know that that code section has been changed and will be presented today. Not changed exactly like the way you had wanted it, with maybe the sprinkler exemption being number one, but it's a little more clear that egress windows are not required unless you have only one X. Is so, opportunity to challenge that? Yes, there is. <laughs> there will, I want to make sure that there will be discussion, <laughs> no voting, and you can't vote. <laughs> so with your uh, outstanding career and Board of Appeals member, I'd like to present you with this plaque for your, all your board service. Thank, Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, board and, and staff. It uh, has been a, uh, a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, uh, no way was I expecting uh, when I got the appointment from Mayor Furness in 98 uh, that it would last 20 years. After 10 years was the, was the uh, expected two-term time. And uh, Mr. Wallacher uh, said, well, that's, that's a tradition that I'm not honoring because I'd like you to serve again. And I did it again uh, a, a fourth time. But uh, a year and a half ago, I retired. And so it was time to uh, get new blood. And uh, I want to again thank uh, Ron Strand, uh, your predecessor, and you for uh, your dedication and the staff for all the work that they do to help us uh, get to uh, the point where we're at. And again, to thank each and every one of the, of, of the board people uh, that have volunteered their time on behalf of the city. Um, we uh, thank you for your time and, uh, and uh, your talent and your expertise to help make the city a better place to live. Thank you much.
wishing to speak must wait until they are recognized by a chairperson. The staff will present all changes from the currently adopted edition for those being discussed at that hearing. The staff will also present comments on the existing amendments to the code in the order in which they would appear in that code. The staff will continue their presentation unless they are interrupted by a chairperson or another member of the Board of Appeals. Votes will not be taken on individual code provisions when it is determined to be necessary by the chairperson or a majority of the board members. All hearings are open to the public and are held specifically for the purpose of receiving public comment. With that, does everyone want to go ahead? Just a reminder for everybody to speak into the mic, but don't eat it so it feedback. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Mike Blevins. I work with building inspections as a commercial building inspector. Today I'm going to be doing chapters 8, 9, and 10 of the International Building Code. I'm presenting the significant code changes that we observed for this code cycle. I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the types of changes real quick. I know you guys are seasoned professionals, but um, there's three different main types of changes that we're going to be looking at. Um, one's a modification, the other is a clarification, and the last one being an addition to the code. And we, we do have in chapters 8, 9, and 10 each one of those that we're going to be seeing. Um, there's some erratas that are also going to be included. There's one specific in fire protection systems that we're going to look at. And then also we do look at amendments as we're going through. Um, we do welcome questions throughout the presentation, so if you guys have anything, they're actually expected, so just stop me where I'm at and we'll try to answer them. If I can't answer them, we have some pretty qualified guys here that could probably help out. All right, that'll go ahead and get started with chapter eight, and we're gonna be on page one of your handout. This section will be found on page 211 of the International Building Code 2018 edition, if you're following along in the code. <coughs> This is an actual amendment, so we're going to start out with that right away. Um, staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, deleting this section in, in its entirety. Um, this is in reference to flood hazard areas, which we have our standalone um, code that we're going to be enforcing in that area, so that one's deleted in its entirety. Second one here is page 211 as well, 803.1.1. Interior and seal ceiling finish materials test in accordance with NFPA 286. And this reads, interior wall and ceiling finish testing criteria have been reorganized to enhance their application and their enforcement. Next one would be 803.1.2, same page, and then we're also still here in chapter eight. Um, this was moved to accommodate the addition of the NFPA 286. And then there's an exception there that says materials tested in accordance with this section and as indicated in sections 803.1.3 through 803.13. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so do these materials then come um, with a, 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 like a, a stamp or, a, or something on them or is it in their literature? There would be a, an actual listing on the on the material more than likely they'll have the NFPA number or the standard that is that it's enforced by and, and what's uh, what's NFPA 286 about again I'll defer that back to Ryan so, so I, I don't know it uh, word for word but 286 and then the other one they referred to are just essentially a flame test um, one of them is a tunnel test uh, and the other is I think a room and corner test but mm -hmm. They burn the materials and then see how much smoke and flame it generates. Okay, and the, 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 um, the uh, uh, for instance, the, um, so they don't, uh, in, the, in the code, they don't say that it has to be tested NFPA 286. Um, so if we don't have this in there, there's no, there's no way of saying, well, this material meets a certain criteria. Is it a, like a flame and smoke sp spread of 2550 or? It looks like there's two different sections. 803, 111 acceptance criteria with 286. And then there's uh, a separate section for wall and ceiling finish 
which has ASTM E84 and UL7233. Uh, half the time, the products might have a label on them. But what, usually what we do, if we see something strange or out of the ordinary, we'll request the manufacturer's information on the product right. mm -hmm. to make sure it fits into one of those paragraphs. So does this actually, is this an or? Is it like it meets it or it meets 286 or and 286? I do believe this is an go. and, so it's basically saying it's classified in accordance with the NFPA 286 and comply with the other following sections, okay. which would be your ASTM requirements. And they typically would be listed on the product. You would see those on there. I'm just wondering if, you know, what if they test it to 286 and they don't test it to ASTM or if they test it to, you, if you're, what, I, what I read here is if they test it to ASTM, that's still not good enough. We, we want it tested to 286. So there would be an and in there, so they have to have both listings. And are and I'm mechanical I, guy, so yep, I don't know yep. that much about. We could it. look at alternative methods. I'm, I'm just I'm just curious if have you seen material data sheets that indeed have both of these, so that we know that we're not putting them into a box where they can only use like two out of ten uh, manufacturers' materials. It, it is either. Oh, so, it's either? Well, 80311 says interior wall ceiling is tested in accordance with NFP 286. Okay. 80312, interior wall ceiling is tested in accordance with ASTM. So it is two different standards that they can use okay. to get to the requirements. Okay. And the, it, you can even see the acceptance criteria. It's different. It doesn't even go by the classes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Thanks. There's even a third acceptance required with different requirement. So, if you run into that scenario, we'd definitely be happy to help you out with it at, at the office there. If you guys are submitting something, you have a question on it, though. But thanks for the question. Thank you, Ryan and Bruce, for helping out with that. We're going to continue on page 212. And 803.3, .3, the heavy timber exemption here is materials considered heavy timber construction must now comply with interior finish requirements were exposed in interior exit stairways and exit passageways. Eight oh three point eleven, laminated products factory produced with a wood substrate. These are now required to meet specific flame spread testing provisions that have been added to the IBC to address the use of factory produced laminated products with the wood substrate as well as facings and wood veneers applied over a wood substrate on site. And that is going to complete the significant changes for chapter 8. We're going to move to chapter 9. Starting on page 217, section 901.6.2, integrated fire protection systems testing. And the states here, test criteria have been added to the code with reference to the new NFPA 4 standard for integrated fire protection and life safety systems testing to ensure that where multiple fire protection systems or life safety systems are integrated, the acceptance process and the subsequent testing must evaluate all of the integrated systems as a whole. Page 218, section 902, fire pump and fire sprinkler riser rooms. A number of prescriptive requirements have been added regulating the design and construction of automatic sprinkler system riser rooms and fire pump rooms. And these would include access, marking on access doors, um, the environment for the lighting environment, and those other requirements there that are stated. Like, do you know if that's um, more to, to give better access to them and easier to find? Is that what those yes, before changes Yes, it was kind of a abbreviated description of what was actually happening in that space. Now they've expanded it to include these other areas with specific references, so you're not having to go around and look for it in multiple spots. Okay. All right. All right, page 218. And then we're looking at 903.2.1, 
sprinklers required in Group A occupancies, the extent to which automatic sprinkler systems are required in multi-story Group A occupancies has been clarified. Previous code language created inconsistencies and is now broken down into separate sections to provide clarification. Page 221, looking at section 903.3.1.1, NFPA 13 sprinkler systems. This is an amendment and staff recommends keeping our existing amendment allowing sprinkler heads in mall tenant spaces to be installed at ceiling height if allowed by the code official. We got to back up to page 219 it looks like here. Sorry for that. Section 903.2.3, sprinklers in group E occupancies, criteria for occupant load threshold and location with the, within the building have been added as conditions that could require sprinkler protection in group E educational occupancies. Page 222, section 903.3.1.2, Point one, point one, point two. Emission of sprinklers in group R4 bathrooms. The fire sprinkler requirements that previously extended to small bathrooms in group R4 occupancies have been deleted. Continuing on page 22 in section 903.3.1.2.1, sprinkler protection at balconies and decks. Where non-rated balconies and similar combustible projections of a dwelling and sleeping units are permitted in type 3A and type 5A buildings, it has been clarified that the sprinkler protection is to be extended to the area of the projections. Splitting between page 222 and 223, section 903.3.1.2.3, protection of attics in group R occupancies, Sprinkler protection or acceptable alternative methods for the protection of attics are now addressed for mid-rise buildings, housing, multifamily occupancies, and equipped with an NFPA 13 sprinkler system. Moving to page 226, in section 90412, commercial cooking operations. The installation of fire extinguishing systems as protection for commercial cooking operations must now also comply with NFPA 96. In addition, commercial cooking systems are now permitted to be protected with a water mist fire extinguishing system complying with NFPA 750. Page 226, section 904.13, domestic cooking protection in institutional and residential occupancies where domestic type cooking operations are present in group I-1 occupancies and college dormitories classified as group R-2, an automatic fire extinguishing system is now mandated in conjunction with the required hood over any cooktop or range. So explain this one to me, please. So my understanding, if you're, if you're in an, an R-2, like a college uh, dorm, and you're using a residential style cooktop range before you maybe would have been able just to have your hood over top of that and I would need to get some information for you to get this dialed in perfectly for you but you would now be required to have like fire suppression over that as well. Ryan did you have any exposure on that? Uh, no I think what you said is accurate and so they sell kind of a UL 300 system that's built for a domestic hood like you'd see in a residential house. It's like a mini Ansel system? Yeah much much smaller and, and uh, we've seen a lot of these requirements kind of getting pushed into the R2 but specific to college and dormitory facilities they, they also have extra requirements for their fire alarms and that too and I one I believe there's uh, institutional occupancies that have wanted to put that little area out in the corridor right. which is I think got into the code last cycle uh, Harold Thompson I remember that we always used to say it's in a rated corridor get it out and uh, now they, they allowed it in there. Uh, it's just an additional requirement for that hood. So it's is it something like a commercial hood where you actually have some kind of a nozzle or whatever right within the hood itself? Yeah, but on a much smaller scale. So in a lot of those systems, you had the Ansel uh, 
you know, which is just one brand of it, but it'll be off to the side and then it's pre-piped into the hood. A lot of these are just self-contained. You would buy the pre-engineered okay. hood system with it on it. Any idea what their cost is? Okay. Have we? Do we have? Are there any installed currently? No, this is this, this is, is new. new. This is new. And then, and maybe that's why that automatic water mist system. We haven't looked into that. First time it's in here. That maybe that can be piped off the standard plumbing water system in the building. A lot easier to do. Okay. We could uh, look that up. And I'm just curious. Yeah. You know, what kind of a burden this will be? And it obviously it's not retroactive. It's uh, moving forward. Yeah. But it, it has allowed those stoves out in the common areas of institutional or R2 type. Is, it, is this going to be within the individual units also if it's an R2 building? It would apply if they had a standalone range. In you know, because in most of those, you're, you're looking at a range with a microwave over the top of it, not a hood. And if you want to see a system that's similar as far as the fire protection aspects are concerned, if you know where Beans Coffee is at, they have their little cinnamon donut fryer in there. They actually have one of these little standalone systems and basically the little Enzel nozzles are facing right over the fryer unit. And then they'll have their compressed, their fire, whatever you want to call it, their gas that they're putting the fire out with underneath the counter in the tank. They have a similar system that would be used, what they're describing. So, okay. So just my, the only thing that, uh, the only other thing that comes to mind is when I look at the five story uh, apartment uh, complex going up on 32nd, and that's basically a dorm, uh, you know, but it's not classified as a dorm. I think it's classified as an apartment. So how do, and in fact, I don't even think they call them dorms anymore. They call them student life centers or something like that. So how do we define a dorm at that point? Well, there are some specific requirements for dormitory. I mean, dormitories is listed in the R2. Okay. So if, if, if there are requirements, it, it may not show up in a standard R2 residential occupancy. So it's, it's probably something that has to be owned and operated yeah, by dormitories the are educational built, institution. They're built a little different. They might have sleeping rooms and a bathroom. They might not have all facilities. They have common area kitchens, things like that. Yeah. So that, that must be what they're addressing is when they put those residential style out in their common areas. So maybe each floor has one. Okay. Yeah, I just, so on campus, yeah. Off campus, you know. Uh, Dormitories are definitely different than a, a residence, a dwelling unit in an apartment building. I have the definition here if you want to hear the definition of dormitory. Sure. Just sure. A space in a building where group sleeping accommodations are provided in one room or in a series of closely associated rooms for persons not members of the same family group under joint occupancy and a single management as in college dormitories or fraternity houses. So now we're on campus and off campus as far as that question was considered. So your fraternity houses and student living centers, all those would fall under that description. And if you, I mean, if again you took the, the, the and, and obviously this wouldn't be retroactive, but if, no. if you were to take the, uh, the five-story apartment building that's down there, you have probably people going to school together that aren't of the same family, um, you know, that are staying together to, you know, share an apartment, so to speak. So, so that is dictated by the designer on the project. If they say it's residential, R2, and all the units fit into that, that's what we accept. Okay. Um, we don't really look at who's combining to be on a lease or anything like that. So. Okay. Um, I mean, if you got real strict with that, half the people live together till they're 35 before they get married. <laughs> so you're going to be clearing out a lot of apartments. <laughs> you know, so there has to be some reasonableness on what you're yeah. doing with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Let's recognize the new board member. It's Mike? Yeah, come on up. Yeah, go on up. Welcome Mike Wild to the board. Um, recognize that he's joining us today. 
and uh, I believe it's your first meeting. Yes, it is. So if you have any questions, let us know. I'll have lots. We'll continue with the process, <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining. All right, we are going to continue on page 227. And we're in section 904.14, aerosol fire extinguishing systems. The installation, inspection, testing, and maintenance of aerosol fire extinguishing systems are now addressed through applicable references to sections 901 and 904.4 of the IBC and the NFPA 2010, as well as the systems listing and manufacturer's instructions. 905.1 standpipe systems. This is an amendment. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment allowing approved standpipe hose valves and connections in place of a fire hose on a standpipe. Continuing on 227 here, section 905.3.1, class three standpipes. Standpipe system protection is now required in those building having four or more stories above or below grade plane, regardless of the vertical distance between the floor level and the highest story and the level of the fire department vehicle access. So with that, a, a three story with underground parking is gonna require standpipes. They don't have the 75 foot rule in there like they had previously, Ryan, you be able to well, it, that? It, so it's it's still referring to four stories above fire department access so uh, you know this was an amendment but I think in all reality I don't know that it really changed much because it's pretty hard to get more than four stories under 30 feet high yeah you know 30 foot well, I just seen it was you know stating above or below grade plane so well and it's the reason it says above or below is because you could do four stories into the ground which is going to require a standpipe well, or you can do four stories above ground would require a standpipe okay you know and they keep that in there for those rare occurrences where you, you know for some reason you're going underground okay. and that's always been in there too where if you've gone underground and previously 30 feet or whatever you had to have a standpipe then too and again, I, I think the question is, and I'm still not, if you have a parking garage below a three-story apartment building, is that considered four stories? I, the way I've always looked at this is that you're, you're counting the stories above grade, so that's one requirement, mm -hmm. and you count your stories below grade, that's a separate requirement. So you're not counting, if you had two under and two up, that's not four stories requiring a standpipe. You need to have four stories above grade or four stories below. So the grade line is the divider. Right, and the whole reason that that's where our truck's sitting, where you're pulling a hose up to, you know, so to go half and half is not a big deal, but to go four up is, or to go four down is also. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I can, it'll help to read the previous section it, that had the 30 feet in there. Okay. And uh, so it said class, Three standpipe systems shall be installed throughout buildings where the floor level of the highest story is located more than 30. So it should be in that case, anytime that the floor level is more than 30, also. Thanks. Continuing on page 228, 905.4 class one standpipe con connection locations. Modifications have been made regarding the locations of host connections within interior exit stairway enclosures, as well as the minimum number of connections required where open breezeways and stairs are provided. Moving to page 231, section 907.2.1, fire alarms in group A occupancies. An additional criterion now mandates the installation of a manual fire alarm system where there is a group A occupant load of more than 100 located above or below the level of exit discharge. Page 232, 907.2.3, and this is an amendment Group E occupancy staff recommends continuing the existing am local amendment which states where approved by the fire code official a building's emergency communication system interfaced with the fire alarm system in accordance with the NFBA 72 is acceptable. 
page 235, 907.2.10. The installation of manual fire alarm system and an automatic smoke detection system is no longer required for R4 occupancies. Page 236, section 907.2.11.2, system response. This is an amendment. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment stating dwelling units with a ceiling height that exceeds the hall by 24 inches or more Smoke detectors shall be installed in the hallway and in the adjacent room. All right, page 251. And this is the errata. This is the only errata that we're between chapters 8, 9, and 10 that we'll be mentioning today. It's in 911.1.3, and this is an addition that further clarifies and corrects verbiage that they had for fire command center room size, stating that fire command center shall be not less than 0.015% of the total building area of the facility served or 200 square feet in area, whichever is greater, with a minimum dimension of 0.7 times the square foot of the room area or 10 feet, whichever is greater. The room shall be not less than 200 square feet with a minimum dimension of 10 feet. Page 255, section 916.2.1, gas detection systems. Gas detection systems has been added to further define and explain the installation of gas detection, including equipment, power connections, sensor locations, and signage. and 917 mass notification systems. College or university campuses have an accumulative building occupant load of a thousand or more. A mass notification risk analysis shall be conducted in accordance with NFPA 72. That's also on page 255. And that wraps up chapter nine. We're gonna move to chapter 10, which is means of egress. It'll be on page 259 for the first section, which is 104.5 and 104.8, occupant load calculation and business use areas. The method of calculating occupant load and business areas has been revised, which will typically result in a reduced design occupant load. However, higher design occupant loads can now be assigned to concentrated business areas, such as telephone call centers and similar use areas. Page 261, section 1006.2.1, group R spaces with one exit or exit access doorway. Allowances for single exit group R spaces have been reformatted and the approach to the accumulating occupant loads from adjacent rooms discharging through foyers and lobbies has been clarified. Page 262, sections 1006.3 and 1006.3.1, egress through adjacent stories. The determination of means of egress requirements has been clarified where the occupants must travel to an adjacent story to reach a complying exit or exits. Page 265, section 1008.2.3, illumination of the exit discharge. This was a simple, but they figured to be significant change, clarifying the illumination provisions as it relates to the ex exit discharge area. Page 265, section 1008.3.5, emergency illumination in group I-2. The section was modified to include a 0.2 foot candle illumination level upon the failure of a single lamp and a multi-lamp lighting unit. Page 267, section 1009.7.2, protection of exterior areas of assisted rescue. The fire resistance rated exterior wall 
with the protected opening separation between a required exterior area of assisted rescue and the interior of the building is no longer mandated, provided the building is protected with an automatic sprinkler system. Page 268, section 1010.1.1. Doors, gates, and turnstiles. Provisions addressing limits to the width and height of door openings have been selectively reformatted and revised as necessary to correlate with the technical accessibility requirements of ANSI A117.1. Page 271, section 1010.1.4.4, locking arrangements and educational occupancies. Guidance has been provided to allow for enhanced security measures on educational classroom egress doors and yet still continue to comply with applicable means of egress requirements. Page 272, section 1010.1.9.4, locks and latches. This is a new proposed amendment for occupied roofs, um, similar to some of these that we're seeing in some of the downtown areas where they maybe have a rooftop deck that they're using as an accessory use to their occupancy. Staff proposes a local amendment to locks and latches in section 1010.1.9.4, and this would add number seven to the existing one that you'll see on page 272 that states, egress doors from occupied roofs or doors that are used to gain access to the interior of the building shall be locked from the outside if all the following are provided. 7.1 is going to kick you back into the locks and locks section, item 2. 7.2 is going to give us the two-way communication requirements. So if someone's stuck out there for whatever reason in this minus 20, they can get in contact with somebody through a communication device. Also in 7.3, the doors, locks, the door locks shall unlock on actuation of the automatic sprinkler system and automatic fire detection system, and the door locking system shall be installed to have the capability of being unlocked by a switch located at the fire command center. And 7.4, a readily visible durable sign is posted on both sides of the door or adjacent to the door stating this door is to remain unlocked when the space is occupied. And the sign shall be in letters one inch high on contrasting black background on background. Page 273, section 1010.1.9.8. Use of delayed egress locking systems in group E classrooms. The allowance for the use of delayed egress locking systems has been expanded to also include egress doors serving Group E classrooms with an occupant load of less than 50, as well as secondary exits or exit access doors serving courtrooms. Page 275, section 1010.1.9.12, locks on stairway doors. Section previously limited to only those stairways serving four or fewer stories. The allowance for stairway doors to be locked on the stairway side until simultaneously unlocked from a signal by emergency personnel is now applicable to all multi-story conditions which are not considered as high-rise buildings. Page 276, section 1010.3.2, security access turnstiles. New conditions of use are now provided to the building official with the criteria to evaluate security access turnstiles that are located in a manner to obstruct a means of egress. Page 276 as well on 1011.1 stairways. This is an amendment, an existing amendment. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment under exceptions that states stairways used only to attend to equipment or private stairways serving an occupant load of 10 or fewer persons and which are not accessible to the public need not comply with sections 1011.2 through 1011.13. Page 
1011.1. Staff also recommends continuing the existing local amendment, which alters the rise and run in groups R2 and R3 and U occupancies that are accessory to a group R3 occupancy to a maximum riser height of eight inches and a minimum tread depth of nine inches. And the exceptions there at item six to state stairways used only to attend to equipment or private stairways serving an occupant load of 10 or fewer persons and which are not accessible to the public are permitted to have a maximum eight inch riser height and a minimum nine inch tread depth. Page 279, section 1011.11, handrails, which is also amendment. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment, which adds exceptions five and six to read as follows. Stairways used only to attend to equipment or private stairways serving an occupant load of 10 or fewer persons and which are not accessible to the public and vehicle service pit stairways are exempt from the rules for stairway railings and guards if they would prevent a vehicle from moving into a position over the pit. Page 281, section 1013.2. The permitted location for low level exit signs selectively required in group R1 occupancies, hotels and motels, has been expanded to now allow the bottom of such sign to be mounted up 18 inches above the floor. Page 283, section 1015.2, guards. This is an existing amendment. Staff recommends continuing the existing local amendment that states the following. Guards shall be located along open-sided walking surfaces, including mezzanines, equipment platforms, stairs, ramps, and landings that are located more than 30 inches above the floor grade, below or within 36 inches horizontally to the edge of the open side of the vertical measurement to the floor grade below is greater than 48 inches guard shall be adequate in strength and attachment in accordance with 1607.8. Page 284, section 1015.6 and 1015.7, fall arrest for rooftop equipment. The prescriptive provisions addressing the installation of personal fall arrest restraint anchorage where mechanical equipment or roof hatches are located close to a roof edge have now been deleted with simply including a reference to ANSI and ASSE Z359.1 standard. Page 286, section 1017.3, measurement of egress travel. Additional language clarifies that the common path of egress travel limitations must be applied to each room or space on every story. Could we go back to the arrest, fall arrest for uh, rooftop equipment? Yes. Um, do you guys consider the, um, the language as far as mechanical equipment or roof hatches are located close? You know, the 10 foot rule used to be, you know, is located within 10 feet. Um, is, am I missing something here? Because uh, located close to is, seems to be one of those things where somebody could say, well, that close. If the guards are required within the 10 foot rule, okay. and then this would be a piece of equipment that was closer than 10 feet or a hatch where you'd actually have to harness off okay. to actually work on the equipment because you're going to be right. within proximity of the edge of the roof or whatnot. Right. Yeah. So, and that's where I was just wondering why it, instead of it saying close to the roof. That's, edge. that is just staff's text on there. Okay. It's not the code. Okay. The code doesn't say close to. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe we can look at revising that when we do our amendments here coming up. Uh, that in, it's already in, if it's already in the code, I'm good. Yeah, uh, it just, just says located within 10 feet. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, page 289, section 1023.3.1, stairway extensions. 
modification stating fire resistance rated separation is not required between an interior exit stairway and its exit passageway extension where both the stair enclosure and the exit passageway are pressurized. Also on page 289, section 1023.5 and 1024.6. Exit stairway and exit passageway penetrations. Security system and two-way communication system components are now specifically permitted to penetrate the fire resistance rated enclosure of exit passageways, interior exit stairways, and interior exit ramps. Page 291, section 1025.1, luminous egress path markings. Luminous e egress path markings is no longer required in high-rise buildings classified as group I-2, I-3, or I-4 occupancies. Page 293, section 1026.4 and 1026.4.1 refuge areas for horizontal exits. The method for determining the minimum required refuge area size where a horizontal exit has been provided has been modified to allow for a more appropriate determination of the occupant load assigned to the refuge area. Page 296 and 297, section 1029.6 and 1029.6.3 open air assembly seating. The various assembly seating methods have been clarified through the introduction of a new definition for open air assembly seating and an expanded definition for smoke protected assembly seating. Page 302, section 1030.1. This was the section that Bruce referenced earlier to herald in this 1030.1 required emergency escape and rescue openings. The openings, the, excuse me, the occupancies where emergency openings are required have been clarified and the minimum number of required openings in a residential basement has been revised. That concludes chapter 10, the significant changes. Anyone has any questions? Um, I, I just have one question. Um, IBC, and is, isn't there also an IRC, International Residential Code? It seems to me there's a lot of residential stuff in here. How come, what's, why did they talk so much about residential stuff? So you did get your IRC, or? Yeah. So there is two books. So when a designer chooses to design a residential occupancy, he's got to make a choice. Is he in the IRC or the IBC? The IRC is, single, is only one and two family dwellings. That's all you can construct. Or townhouses, anything that's considered a single family. Um, there's this, there's uh, definitions of townhomes and row houses and things okay. like that. So if you're in the IRC, so there are many requirements for residential in this book but they should be for resi multi-unit residential occupancies, mostly. The, the thing that we run into, strangely, is that condos are considered an R2, just like an apartment building. That comes up a lot of times in accessibility, but they're considered the same thing, same building. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for the question. All right, that'll conclude chapters eight, nine, and 10. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board members. My name is Doug Desitel. Uh, I'm a commercial plans examiner in the city of Fargo. And we're gonna go through chapters 11 through 15. If you have any questions, just stop me where I'm, I'm going to try and get through this. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to page, uh, we're at chapter 11, accessibility. And we're on page 305, section 1102. The 
2018 IBC has removed the specific definition in chapters 11 and placed them in chapter 2 with all the definitions. In addition, the heading has been changed from definitions to compliant. Page 306. Section 1103.2.14, walk-in coolers and freezers. The word has been added to state freezer equipment access. There was a little bit of a confusion there. Page 306, section 1104.4, multi-buildings and facilities. There has been a verbiage ad added to the items and occupied roofs. They've added the occupied roofs into that section 1104 page 306 1104.4 we have a local amendment we propose to keep that amendment um, that states inspection has a previous amendment to this section that states accessible route is not required to stories basements mezzanines and occupied roofs that have an area of not more than 3,000 square feet and are located above or below accessible levels and are below the third story. 1104.4, exception number two, occupied roofs have been added to the exception number two. Page 310. <laughs> Eleven oh seven point six point one point two, Group R one accessible units have added the text on multiple building sites to the second sentence. Page three ten eleven oh seven point six point two point two, apartment houses, monasteries, and convents have added the text to the end of this section. Bedrooms and monasteries and convents shall be counted as un units for the purpose of determining the number of units. Where the bedrooms are grouped in sleeping units, only the bedrooms in each sleeping unit shall count towards the number of required type A units. Page 311, 1107.6.2.3, group R, other than live work units, apartment houses, monasteries, and con convents. They have added the text dormitories, sorority, sororities, fraternities, and boarding houses. Also, the last sentence has been changed to state uh, where the bedrooms are grouped in dwelling or sleeping units, only one bedroom in each dwelling or sleeping unit shall be permitted to count towards the number of required accessible units. 1107.6.3, page 311, group R3. The following uses have been added to this sentence. Bedrooms within congregate living facilities, dormitories, sororities, and boarding houses shall be counted as sleeping units for the purposes of determining the number of units. Page 311. This, this gets back to your question, Dave. Here's an R3, and some people correlate R3 to single family home, and, and it's not. R3 is in the IBC. So if you choose R3, in, an, in the IBC, there's other requirements. Like you will be sprinklered, odds are you'll be sprinklered. So it sounds the same, and sometimes the, the words show up in the same paragraph, R3 resident IRC, but there is a difference between the two. Thank you. Page 311, 1107.7.1.2, additional stories within type B units. The first sentence has been clarified to state where stories have entrances not including included in determining compliance with section 1107.1 and such entrances are proximate to arrival points intended to serve units on that story. Page 315, 1109.2.1.2, family or assisted use toilet rooms. 
there's been two additional exceptions added to this section. Number two, a child height water closet, and number three is a child height lavatory. Uh, page 317, 1109.15. Gaming machines and gaming tables. More practical approach to the uh, appropriate distribution of accessible gaming machines and gaming tables in casinos and other gaming facilities has been established and new definitions provide guidance in the application <coughs> of the revised provisions. Page 319, section 1110.4.13, play areas. This section has been added to the parent section of recreational facilities. This section of the code states play areas containing play components designed and constructed for children shall be located on an accessible route. Page 320. Section 1111.3, other signs, number two. This section has been re or re uh, organized and the meaning has not changed. And that is going to be chapter 11. Chapter 12 is interior environment. We have a local amendment. It's on page 321 to section 1202.1. Inspection has a current amendment to the ventilation. Delete the first sentence and second paragraph as follows. And we're basically taking the air, um, the air blower test requirement out because we've added some things into the, um, the energy code that's going to make it clearer. This way, you don't have to do a blower door test on every single, single family home we build, basically. Basically, then you're requiring building more to prescription and We do a visual do test. We have an amendment that gives us a visual test on the products as they're putting in together okay. to exempt this out. So we, we just removed it. Okay. from the IBC, basically. There's some background on this one that gets really complicated, such as there were, was a requirement for residential occupants to, be, to meet at three air change per hour. And then this one came in and said, if you're less than five, you will have mechanical. If you're building in Moorhead, I think I discussed that with them, that they're required to have some type of mechanical system in all residential. We haven't taken that leap yet. We think that the code will get corrected someday for that requirement. Because it still has ventilation requirements for windows. Um, but we amended out for that reason, the five and three discrepancy. You're required to meet three. If you're less than five, you have to do mechanical. We don't believe that the code has caught up that requirement to require mechanical in every residential dwelling unit. Okay. So we'd propose to keep that amendment. Uh, page 321, section 1202.2, roof ventilation. The parent section has been renamed from ventilation required to roof ventilation. Page 322. Section 1202.4, underfloor ventilation. Sections 1202.4.1 through 1202.4 through point four have been added to be separate sections within the code for clarity. The new sections were previously exceptions to 1203.4.2 in the 2015 IBC. Uh, page 323, we, uh, we have a del deleted this section of the code since we have our own uh, flood proof policy in, in place in Fargo. <coughs> Page 324, 
We have a local amendment pre previously on uh, sound transmission. Uh, and this section was previously deleted from the 2015 IBC inspections. Would like the Board of Appeals to make the determination if this section should now be placed within the 2018. So we're kind of asking your input on this. We've never enforced the sound transmission. It's, it's mainly in, in our occupancies, apartments. Um, I did some research. I looked at some well systems, and I didn't see anything that wouldn't comply. So I really don't know why we have removed it in the past, to be honest with you. So that's going to be Bruce and the board members. You guys are going to have to tell us if you want to put it in or not. And we're going to recommend to leave it in. Uh, because of Doug's research that most all new buildings now comply. Um, I think in the past with you can just see the prescriptive construction of dimensional lumber and five ace fire code and whatever they put on the top may not have met the sound transmission, but people do not build that way anymore. There's different fire race rated assemblies that have channel in and insulation and most of them meet the requirements of sound transmission. Okay. Could we have uh, uh, perhaps Gretchen or someone notify the other board members by email or whatever that, that they should review this and look at it and we point? don't have enough people to vote today anyway but yep. something we can bring up later after they've reviewed it. Yep and that can be discussed anytime between now and the, the final vote at the last meeting. I believe and record. I think you can do either or. If you want to do the, the field thing, you're, you're more than welcome. Uh, page 325, section 1207.2, minimum ceiling heights. Burbage has been added in three locations at the end of the sentences to state above the finished floor. And that's, that would be chapter 12. Chapter 13, energy efficiency. This section uh, will be designed and constructed in accordance with the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code. I really don't understand why that's there when we have the energy code already, to be honest with you, but just my opinion. Uh, chapter 14 is exterior walls. Uh, page 329, section 1401.1, the scope. The following items have been removed from the end of the scoping section, and they would be balconies and similar projections and bay and Oreo wells. Windows, actually. Page 330. Uh, we have a local amendment previously deleting um, this section since we have our own flood proofing policy in place in Fargo. It's going to be sections 1402.6 and 1402.7 flood resistance and flood resistance for coastal high areas and coastal A zones are hereby deleted in there entirely. So we'd like to just keep that out of the code. Page 331, table 1404.2, minimum thickness of weather coatings. The minimum required thickness of masonry and stone veneer weather coatings has been updated to align with the current industry standards. Page 331, table 1404.3.2, class three vapor retarders. The words have been changed from insulated 
sheeting to continuous sheeting. Page 332. Section 1404.4. Flashing. The following text has been added to the end of this section of the code where self-adhered membranes are used as flashings for fenestration in wall assemblies. Those self-adhered flashing shall comply with AAMA 711 where fluid applied membranes are used as flashing for exterior wall openings. These fluid applied membrane flashing shall comply with AAMA 714. Page 332. Section 1404.4.2, masonry. There has been a, a maximum height of 10 inches for the location of flashing and weep holes above the finished ground level, above the foundation wall or slab. Page 336. Section 1405.1, the general or parent section has been removed from the 2015 code, or from the, it was in the 15 code and they've removed it now in the 18. So that wraps up chapter 14. And chapter 15 is roof assemblies and rooftop structures. Page 341, section 1502, roof drainage. This section of the code has been relocated and has been removed from weather protection requirements in the 2015 IPC. Page 342, section 1504.2.1.1, overturning resistance. The standard has been added to the text or ASTM C1568. Page 342, section 1504.3, wind resistance of non ballasted roofs. The text has been added to the end of, the, of this section to state the wind load on the roof covering shall be permitted to be determined using allowable stress design. Page 342, section 1504.3.3, metal roof shingles. Metal roof shingles are now addressed separately from the other metal panel roof systems with reference made to applicable standards for the labeling and testing of wind resistance for shingles. Page 342, table 1504.1.1, this table has been Relabeled from classification of asphalt shingles to classification of steep slope roof shingles tested in accordance with ASTM D316 or D71581. Page 344, underlayment. Section 1507.1.1. One, underlayment. Underlayment and ice barrier requirements have been relocated from sections describing each type of roofing material and placed into one section describing the type, attachment, and application of the underlayment. Page 345, section 1507.1.2, ice barriers. This section of the code is now list, listed the different types of roof coverings that will require the ice barrier installation. Page 345, section 1507.2.5, fasteners. Inspections had a previous local amendment to such this section. Inspection rec recommends removing this amendment. Um, I guess I personally didn't see why we wouldn't go, why we took it out anyway. I guess we added the verbiage before in the amendment that the building official had the right to 
say you could use what kind of fasteners you wanted to, basically. If Bruce decided that's what he wants, that's what he could do. I'm saying every manufacturer tells us how to um, how to fasten the materials to a roof system. So why would we take it out of, of the code when it's already there? So and there is this section 104 that allows for alternative methods yeah. of design and materials and construction anyway. Right. So anybody can really propose any type anyway. Yeah, and I don't know why we would consider it myself because we'd be taking liability at that point where we could just throw it back to the manufacturer if we fasten it the way they told us to do it it's not our problem then it's it's a manufacturer's problem so we would recommend getting rid of that amendment probably page 352 Section 1507.8.9, label required. Under the parent section of 1507.8, wood shingles, there has been a new section that states each bundle of shingles shall be identified and labeled by an approved grading or inspection bureau or agency. Page 353, section 1509.9.10. This is similar to the last one. It's label required. Under the parent section of 1507.9, wood shakes, there is a new section that states each bundle of shakes shall be identified by a label of an approved grading or inspection or bureau or agency. Page 354. 1507.11.2.1, base sheet. This is a new subsection to material standards. The section will read as a base sheet that complies with the requirements of section 1507.11.2, comma ASTM D1970 or ASTM D4601 shall be permitted to be used with a modified but Vietnam cap sheet. Page 355, section 1507.8, building integrated photovoltaic roof panels. This is a new section that has been added within the code body. Page 355, section 1507. 1507.18.2, um, here's one of those <coughs> erratas, you may want to just put a little E by this section in the code. There's an errata to the text. The word horizontal should be placed behind the number 12. Fifteen oh seven point eight point four point one on page 355. There's an errata to the text as well here. In the middle of the paragraph, the code section 1507.2.8 should be changed to 1507.1.1. So I don't know if you want to put a little E. That's how I keep track of them. I put an E by the code section. Page 358. Section 1511, inspections has a, a local amendment that has relocated this section previously to Appendix N. Inspections would like to recommend to keep the re-roofing section 1511 in the main body of the 2018 IBC. So that's another one we'll have to do some, I don't know why we took out the re-roofing in the past. It may have had to do with, with personnel and not enough people to inspect it possibly. Um, but we think it should remain in the code. So I did a little background research on this too and we feel that there's no real need to take it out. There's still no permit required for re-roofing. 
but there should be some information for somebody that is re-roofing in the code. There's other things that aren't in the code that require a permit also, so at least there's a, some information if somebody asks what is required. And I hate clarification on that, Bruce. So what you're saying is there's requirements in the code for re-roofing as far as how re-roofing is done, and yet, but there's no um, permit required and no inspection that's required by the codes department. Yeah, and e even our department would like the guidance. It's still in our book. We don't remove it and cut it out. But re-roofing is, we spent some time talking about that. It is just re-roofing. It's taking off an old roof and doing the exact same roof. If somebody asks us, we can kind of say, are you doing that? If anything changes, a permit should be required, but there's still no inspection required for a re-roof. But there's still requirements in this section of the code of yeah. how you do re-roofing. Can you go over four layers of shingles? Can you, this will give you some guidance of what you can do and can't do. So if, if they were to go from, say, asphalt shingles to a metal roof, would that then? We would say permit. Then it's a permit. Yes. But again, still no inspection required. Correct. They're, the requirements are there. We can show them. We can talk about them. It's just strange that we removed it from the code because it's, there's requirements. Um, we're not going to ignore those requirements. It was, it was kind of a department policy in the past of how you deal with re-roofing. And it was, eh, don't talk about it, don't do it, don't permit it, don't inspect it. Well, it's still no permit required. There's still no inspection required, but there's requirements that we want to keep them in there. So what would happen if somebody goes in, re-roofs, and doesn't do it according to the code, and it ends up being a problem? Then who, do, do, does the codes department at that point get dragged into something it, I, that's the only reason I could imagine that they took it out because a lot of re-roofing gets done and that would be a tremendous amount of manpower and then it's a liability issue. Yep, and that is the very important part of the building. Yep. Um, there are many things in the code. If you go back and look at the inspections required in Chapter 1, you're going to see what we inspect. And I used to tell people there, we're there five times. After the energy code, we might be there seven or eight times. But there's many things we don't inspect, and there's many hours we're not there at the building to see what goes on. So it's most likely a quality issue, unless he changed that. If, if somebody come in and ask for a permit, would say, are you replacing it? They, yes, I'm taking off two layers of foam, putting them back on, I'm putting on a ballasted, it, it's exactly the same. Are you changing it? Nope, now it's new. Now there's new requirements for ballots that are not. And they should know those and look at them. Um, a permit's really going <clears> to <throat> offer to the, pers the owner of the building that this person is licensed and he knows what he's doing. He knows the code. Is there any separation in there between residential and commercial? No, we, we do look at that the same, I believe. Yeah. Just thinking out for loud. permitting and... Yeah. For, the, for the folks who may not know, you know, let's say, case in point, taking off a fully adhered membrane and coming in with a ballasted cheaper system, and structurally, it's not maybe meant for that you know, yep. square foot or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Fire rated roof or not. There you go. That's an important one. Right. We, we do look at it the same. We tend to think we look at the code more like the code. Minnesota has some background information. So it's strange that we do things a little different across the river. They inspect roofs that is not required by the code. We don't. They permit roofs, not required. We permit siding because it's required. They don't permit siding. So it's different. Uh, we have meetings. We try and coordinate. That's one of two things we can't really come to this thing, an agreement on. but. We do it how we feel the code looks at it. Thank you. Section R, page 358, uh, section 1511.1. There's another errata here that you could probably change. The, to the text of exception number two, the last code section number should be changed to 
1502.2. And that's all I have on Chapter 15. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> I will do a little report on a RADA that was mentioned several times here. Um, I'm going to do some research on how a RADA was looked at in the past and how we're going to look at it during this code cycle. So a RADA is changes, it could even be grammatical changes or spelling changes that weren't done in the first printing and they're catching up. I'm going to find out how many erratas are done, how many are put out, published, because the staff has looked at them, so they're giving you that information. But I want to make sure by the time we adopt that we do it the right way. Are we adopting at a period of time everything that we've discussed, or are we adopting with a rata? So I'll report on that next time. So you're saying this, this book is not necessarily the final book? For 2018, I believe there's seven, eight, or nine printings. There's mistakes from the printing. All of the erratas that I mentioned are in the first printing. So if you look at the beginning of the book, I don't know if you have the first printing. You probably do. You have the second one. Some of these things may have been changed from the first printing to the second printing. It'll go up to four printings, I think. So, but yeah. So this says first printing August 2017. The ones that I mentioned. Yeah, there was a date. In your book. There was a date on your errata. I believe it was was it April, April, April 2018. So I'll find out when they come out and just report to you next time. And they change constantly. People that start using the book figure out, and then we contact the code council. And say, this is wrong. And so then they put it on their list. So it's something you can check on. I mean, we can check on it. We had a little discussion on that this morning. We feel that even the code changes you're going to see over the next five months are enough changes, other than muddy it with changes every six months or a year. And that does happen. The code book does get rewritten. So that's what I'll report on next. What, what happens um, with um, so the amendments that we have to the code between when we adopt this and then the next cycle, if there are indeed, you know, it, instead of it shouldn't have been 12 inches, it's 12 feet, you know, are they, um, what happens then? Do those then go, do you, do you guys make amend, any changes to any amendments? If, um, any, if anybody challenged us on something like that, we would, we would go back to commission with something like that. That rarely happens. We do have some common sense, and most, and usually the public does. So we usually work those things out. Yeah, I was just wondering yeah. if, if it's written anywhere or documented anywhere when you found those things and changed. Because there's the yeah. City of Fargo amendments, right, mm -hmm. to the code that you can go online, you can download them, you can, you can see them. And I was just wondering if those get added to it all after. Uh, the code's approved. Not that I remember ever happening. It's okay. like a snapshot in time, and that's good that you can rely on that for three years. And if it if it does get changed, which I don't remember one, you ever remember? Well, but you're referring to the errata, other than right? errata. It yeah. would be like, oh, geez, that's a goof. There shouldn't be an and there. There should be an or there. Or yeah, I, I was going to mention that too. That the errat errata shouldn't ever change the intent of the code. It's just them clarifying where they've messed up in the printing. So if it was changing the intent, it couldn't come through as then a rat. it's not a rat. Okay. That, okay, thank you for that But Mike did have one that we thought should be an amendment. Is that the first one that you brought up? Well, and I, I'll have to look when we get to the fire code on that one. I think maybe what that errata was was that they didn't carry it over to the building code, and they actually put that in the fire code, so that it still went through committee as a change, but it just didn't get printed in your guys. 
off all that but and, and we do need to coordinate too fire code will be done later and you see i think i mentioned this the prefixes in front of some of the sections you'll see an f on some of them those are they should be the same as the fire code so even those committees go work at different times in the international code council so there could be discrepancies there so we're going to try and make them right but all the f means is that it's done in the fire committee they mm -hmm. have the authority over that section and then it transfers to our book should be similar okay thank you um with that we uh, on our agenda had election of officers and correction to bylaws which we don't have a quorum so we won't be doing any of that today uh, are there any other staff reports no. uh, seeing none uh, call for adjournment somebody want to make a motion to adjourn to make a motion to adjourn do we have a second a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye opposed aye. meeting is adjourned If things like this have happened to you, call 